Uh, you, you don't mind if the talk will be recorded and published later, right? Sorry. Uh, is it okay if we record your presentation? Yes, it is published. So there's not unpublished data here. So already I did, yeah. Oh. Actually, I made you as a co-host that you can share your screen, but maybe at first we can introduce Annie. Yeah. Oh, it's... <laughs> All right, so today we have uh, our 13th uh, presentation for this year and also final presentation. It's a pleasure to host Anne Eriksson that I know personally from Technical University of Denmark and she accepted this invitation. And um, so Anne did her master uh, degree at uh, the University of Southern Denmark, SDU. And uh, in a center for living technology, Flint, uh, with people that I also know, and uh, particularly one of her supervisors, uh, Pierre Elaine Monard, right? Yeah. And, uh, but most of the thesis work, as Anna told me, was done as an external stay in the lab of Professor Gonan Akshinasi at Ben Gurion University. And then uh, after defending the thesis, she joined the uh, Technical University of Denmark, DTU Nanotech for a PhD in ocular drug delivery and cell transplantations from retinal neuropathy. And during her PhD, she did an external stay at uh, Shepens Eye Research Institute at Harvard Medical School in Boston, studying retinal organoids grown from stem cells and transplantation of stem cell derived cells. And after finishing the PhD, she continued uh, at the lab for two years before receiving a Carlsberg Foundation, that is International Postdoc Grant, and the Ludwig Foundation Postdoc Grant, that allowed Anne to move her research to Blenkinsop Lab at uh, Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York where she began in March 1st last year and currently working up to date. Yeah. So uh, it's a pleasure for us to hear and welcome you. So please, the uh, screen is yours. Thank you so much and thank you for that very kind introduction. So I'll go ahead and do you see presenter mode now? Yes, yes. Perfect, thank you. So my title is, uh, my, my talk is entitled Studying SARS-CoV-2 Infection uh, in the Eye Using Eye uh, Organoid Cultures. Uh, no, can I change? Not really. Um, so <clears throat> uh, December 31st, uh, 2019, the World Health Organization was notified about uh, pneumonia of unknown origin and on the on, and on January 10th 2020 uh, the novel coronavirus identif was identified through high throughput sequencing and that coronavirus was SARS-CoV-2 uh, the cause of COVID-19 as we know it. This is how the genome overall looks. It has uh, two open reading frames uh, and then it has a spike encoding uh, sequence that uh, gives rise to this uh, spike protein uh, at the nucleo uh, at the envelope of the virus then it has a envelope protein uh, and uh, an end cap sign that uh, is a nucleo capside that binds the rna uh, material inside of the virus envelope um, this spike protein is uh, what makes it a coronavirus. So it, it decorates the surface of the envelope like this corona and this, and it can bind to a surface receptor called uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two uh, that is on the surface of mucosal cells specifically found in the uh, respiratory tract, but also found in the eye and in the colon. Um, so here you, I've tried to draw how it binds, and then when uh, when the virus binds to this receptor, uh, it uh, recruits a 
protease and the, transmem uh, the transmembrane protease called Tempres 2 is the protease that has been most strongly associated with classical SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so it, it recruits this protease to the virus that's bound, and then uh, the protease will, will cleave at a specific site in the spike protein, making um, membrane fusion possible, and then uh, you will have an infected cell as a result. So uh, as I alert to, there is, uh, this receptor is associated with mucosal surfaces and in the eye, we have uh, an exposed mucosal surface. So we being uh, an, eye re uh, an eye focused research group decided to look into what are the uh, knowledge about uh, infections in the eye with the COVID-19. Um, and in the early days of, to 2020, uh, a bunch of uh, case reports started popping up. Um, there is this one from Sang and Xian in China, <clears throat> who reported on a patient who presented uh, with COVID and also had a conjunctivitis, as you see here in the image A, <clears throat> where you have this redness and you can see that the eye surface is really irritated and infected. Uh, and this uh, swab was positive for the viral uh, genome through PCR sequencing. Uh, the symptoms was actually alleviated and this patient did recover. Uh, and this was using uh, Glanco severe eye drops, which is an antiviral eye drop for treating uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, around the same time, Kula, 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 Kula Vita, uh, in uh, Italy reported on a patient who also presented with a conjunctivitis uh, with a COVID-19 uh, positive test. And they, they found that if they collected the tears of this person, they could actually infect Vero E cells. Uh, um, and the Vero E6 cells are the, are the cell line that we also use in the lab to propagate the virus. Um, so the fact that they could show that these tears uh, up to 30 days after the symptoms presented were actually infectious towards these cells kind of alluded to the fact that you could possibly have an infection arising in the eye and spreading to your uh, respiratory tract. Um, because everything uh, is connected uh, in your face and through the scalp's canal, you will have drainage into your nose cavity and then down to your throat. Um, in a meta study also from 2020, uh, it was estimated that around 12 and a half percent of patients uh, actually have some form of ocular complication due to COVID. Uh, and these complications are most like uh, most predominantly conjunctivitis, uh, but also uh, soreness of the eye and dry eye uh, is associated with this disease. So we were then <clears throat> really interested in looking at this and we were so lucky uh, to receive a donation of a cornea from a person, person who died uh, after testing positive for COVID-19. Uh, I will stress here that this person didn't die from COVID-19, uh, but from other uh, events, uh, but tested positive uh, as the person came in uh, and uh, tissue were harvested for uh, organ donation. Uh, so obviously these uh, corneas were rejected because of this uh, positivity and we then received them and decided to, to look at uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the eye um, surface. So here you see a uh, tissue section that has been stained for the angiotensin converted enzyme uh, 2, ACE2 in red and SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in green. Uh, and I hope you can appreciate that there is a 
a really strong staining uh, and also uh, a quite strong overlap in the cornea. Uh, what is interesting to us was to see is that uh, the ACE2 receptor is really expressed in the limbus area to a really high degree. Um, Uh, what you can also appreciate from this is that we don't really see any uh, staining in the stromal part of the cornea. We only see it in the epithelial layer of the cornea. Uh, we then went on to um, isolate cells from healthy donor eyes uh, so that we would have monocultures uh, of different uh, tissue origin. So here you see our cells from the cornea, limbus, sclera, iris, RPE, and choroid. And I've put in a little drawing here for the people who are maybe not so familiar with eye anatomy so that you can have an idea from where these uh, different cells are taken. So what happens is that we dissect uh, the donor eye uh, out into these different tissues, uh, then we um, then we digest them uh, with collagenase until we have a single cell uh, suspension uh, that usually takes around three hours uh, in a really uh, gentle uh, enzymatic environment, and then we seed them onto tissue culture plates coated with Cintamax. Uh, and culture them for up to several months. Uh, these can be in culture, but uh, these particular ones have been in culture for two to four weeks. And uh, as a control, we stained with typical markers for the different tissues here. Uh, so you can see the cornea is positive for the cytokeratins keratin-3 and keratin-12 that are specific for the cornea. The limbus is really highly expressing the uh, stem cell uh, marker P63, the, which makes sense because uh, the limbus is a bed of, um, of stem cells that will uh, help you if you get a scratch on your cornea stem cells from the limbal area will migrate into the cornea and heal it, um, where the corneal cells are non-proliferative. Uh, and the same for the sclera. The limbus stem cells can also go into the sclera and become sclera cells. Um, we have sclera cells right next to the limbus here. They are stro one positive, uh, as they should be. We have uh, iris muscle cells here. They are positive for the eye field marker PAC6, uh, and they are also positive for the muscle marker alpha smooth muscle actin. Uh, we have uh, retinal pigment epithelium or RPE. They have uh, pigment associated genes, uh, although pigmentation in culture uh, disappears. Uh, we still see these genes expressed. Uh, MIDF and OTX2. And then we have the choroid cells uh, that are negative for OTX2, which is how we distinguish them from the RPE. Uh, and then, uh, but then they're positive for MIDF. We then took our primary cells uh, and um, tried to expose them to SARS CoV 2 virus uh, and looked. Uh, in Q, um, and, did, and did a qPCR to um, quantify the viral replication inside uh, these cells. And as you can see here, uh, all of the cell lines gave rise to some form of uh, some level of expression of the viral genome uh, uh, with no real statistical significance between any of the tested cells. Um, we also tested the level, uh, expression level of uh, Tempras 2 and ACE2, the entry factors that are associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, and here we did see that the limbal cells were really sticking out as the highest expression cells for, for Tempras 2 and also for ACE2 with the 
RPE being the only one that has the same level uh, of ACE2 expression, but RPE then lacks uh, this Tempris2. Um, so this taken into account, it was a little bit uh, curious to us that we didn't see a difference in the in the qPCR of the of the SARS-CoV-2 infection, and therefore we we decided to look a little further into it. So here you see the uh, RNA seq uh, read coverage from the different cells of the ocular surface, the cornea, the limbus, and the sclera. Uh, and this tells a little bit of a different story. So here you see that we did, do actually have more reads and a better read coverage for the limbus cells, corresponding with the higher expression of the entry factors in these cells. So that made us uh, aware that, okay, the limbus cells are really the cell type that drives this uh, infection, at least they're really um, prone to infection with this particular virus. Um, but what happens uh, then if we look at it for a whole eye uh, at the same time? Because uh, obviously uh, doing a monoculture in the lab and having a real life uh, scenario where you have a whole eye that uh, might be exposed is two very different things. So we came up with this uh, model to study it in a little bit more realistic um, scenario. So we have a whole eye organoid uh, in the Blinken sublab that we worked on before. Um, it's called uh, SEAM for short, and it stands for Self-Formed Ectodermal Autonomous Multisone uh, and it refers to the way these organoid cultures grow in these um, zones. So here I've tried to draw, draw it. So it all starts with uh, one colony of uh, human embryonic stem cells. And then we initiate differentiation by changing to a differentiation media. Uh, and then they start growing these uh, consecrant ring uh, structures uh, of different cell types. So in zone one, which is the middle, uh, there will be the neuroectoderm. That is what we will, uh, in a mature organoid, see more as a retina. Um, and recently that did came up, come out a publication from another lab using a sim the same model, um, where they specifically looked at differentiating photoreceptors uh, and with a little bit of the tweaking of the protocol, they succeeded in doing a full retina, uh, full mature retina in these kind of organoids. So uh, that's zone one. So that's really interesting, uh, but maybe not for us. We were more interested in the ocular surface. Uh, so we are, <clears throat> so zone two is op optic cup derivatives. So that will be the, um, pigmented cells that you also see here in the picture as uh, black cells. They are pigment epithelium from the, like the RPE, but also like the iris. Um, and then we have zone three, which is the most interesting for us. It's ocular surface ectoderm. These are the cells that will be your corneal cells and your um, uh, limbus cells. And then we have zone four, which is surface ectoderm. It's more generalized. It has a tendency to become, to look like a sclera, but uh, we will also see uh, hematopoietic cells in this uh, region. We'll also see skeletal muscle cells in this region. Um, so this was, uh, the model we had going and we were like, oh, well, we have the interesting cell types in here. So we will go ahead and, uh, and look further into to those cell types. Um, so here we identify limbal cells in the seam organoid model uh, using single cell RNA-seq. Um, and uh, this is a close up of the, of the UMAP uh, of the 
of the population that looks like uh, uh, limbus. Um, and looking into it really closely, we did find that um, some of the ocular surface ectoderm here uh, actually were more like epidermis. Um, but we also had a subpopulation that was more like limbus. Uh, and here are the specific interesting markers. So you see we have more keratin-4 going towards the limbal one, where we have more keratin-5 in, uh, in the epiderm culture uh, or, uh, cluster. The cluster here uh, um, stands out with this uh, generalized uh, mark. Keratin-5 is a marker of generalized um, stratified epithelium. So we know that it's directional and it's really becoming mature, but we also see that uh, it's more epiderm-like here. Um, we also saw uh, HOPX expression as a good marker of it being more limbus-like. Uh, and I'll come back to that marker later as well. Uh, what we also see here is that we have really low expression of the corneal specific uh, keratins, keratin three and keratin 12, uh, which points to the fact that this is an organoid from stem cells. So they're obviously not as mature as say, um, as an eye on an adult human being. Um, what we also saw uh, is the expression of this um, mucosal gene uh, protein, MUC16, uh, which again uh, contributes to our uh, confidence in that these cells are actually mucosal producing uh, and part of a mucosal surface and not just skin. Um, and here it's the violin plots of some uh, of these. Uh, and here again, you see the skin keratin, keratin one uh, being really lowly expressed in the limbus one, where in the epidermal one, it's really high. Uh, so that's uh, our take home message here, uh, that we do see a sub cluster that is very limbus like in origin. Um, then uh, looking at this cluster, uh, can we then find the SARS-CoV-2 entry factors, ACE2 and TEMPRIS2? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, but maybe not to such a high degree uh, as we had hoped. Um, so here uh, is the data from the single cell seek uh, experiment. And we have um, roughly, 6.5% uh, double positive cells in this cluster, uh, expressing both uh, the entry factors. Um, and here we stained uh, seen another seam culture with the antibodies we used previously uh, and counted them, uh, counted the cells manually. Uh, and we got to almost the same results. We have roughly 7%. Uh, double positive cells uh, in this uh, zone free region. We went on then, uh, now we had identified the interesting uh, cell types in our organoid uh, to try and infect them with the SARS CoV 2 virus. Uh, and here you see the read coverage from the mRNA seq uh, of three different steam cultures that were infected. Uh, and you see that we have full read coverage. We have the whole genome represented. Um, so that tells us that, yes, there is uh, actually an infection going on. Excuse me. And, um, and this virus can replicate inside uh, these uh, seam organoids. Uh, this is also shown uh, in a bit more old fashioned, but also quite elegant way in this uh, plaque essay readout over here. So the way um, the way this plaque essay works is that you take your culture and you infect it. And then at different time points, uh, up to 72 hours after, uh, you take off uh, media uh, from the supernatant of the cells. 
And then you use that conditioned media to infect viral E cells. Um, and then after a short incubation time in the viral E cells, uh, you put a jellifying uh, media on top uh, so that they cannot exchange uh, media through diffusion anymore. Um, and then you know that one uh, dead colony that will die due to the infection uh, is from one uh, uh, virus particle. Uh, and then you stain uh, your samples uh, after 24 hours and then count how many um, uh, little dead colonies do I have uh, from each time point. And here we see that we do have a uh, exponential growth uh, of, the <clears throat> of the viral input uh, until 36 hours where it kind of plateaus out. Uh, so this tells us that uh, we can put in a virus on a seam organoid and it will actively produce more virus, virus uh, particles. Uh, looking further into which kind of cell type uh, gets infected in these organoids, we performed single cell RNA-seq on a healthy organoid and an organoid that was infected with SARS-CoV-2. And here you see the integrated UMAP uh, in, uh, on the right side, on the left side, sorry, uh, that has been annotated um, according to the different cell types that we find. So you see here that we find the limbus and the epidermis as such we talked about before in the model organoid uh, where we identified first the limbus. Uh, we see that here as well in these two organoids. Uh, we have cornea, we have some stratified epithelium and we have some ocular surface ectoderm. We have some neuroectoderm we have a dorsal arctic cup, that's the immature, but uh, cells going toward pigmented cells. Uh, so we have the RPE and iris cells. We have some sclera cells and we have some nerves. Uh, and uh, in the UMAP on the right, uh, I've colored the two data sets in blue and red so that you can see that both um, data sets represent all cell types. Uh, so we have a good, good uh, integration and we have a good coverage uh, of these two organoids. Um, we then looked into where did we actually see this infection? And we did that uh, looking specifically for the spike protein expressed uh, in these cultures. And what, I, uh, what we then saw, was that uh, there was this um, specific uh, island coming out of the ocular surface ectoderm and actually coming out uh, from the limbus uh, cluster that was really highly infected. Uh, and actually this particular cluster, it's separating from the original limbus cluster, therefore we call it limbus two. Uh, and one of the most, uh, some of the most identifying uh, gene markers uh, for this specific cluster is the virus genes. So that will be the spike gene, the nucleocapside of the virus and the envelope uh, of the virus. So one of our hypotheses for this uh, separation is actually that these cells are so infected that they separate out only due to their expression level of virus genes. Um, but uh, anyway, we had to go ahead and treat them as two different uh, clusters. So that's what we did uh, in the analysis moving on. So here we see that um, uh, we have the stratified markers. So this is a stratified epithelium in both cornea and limbus, uh, keratin-4, which is limbus uh, associated, is highly expressed uh, in the limbus clusters. 
uh, we have a lack of uh, gap junctions uh, from uh, both the P2 and A1 type in the limbus, which makes sense as well. We have the MUC16, as I hope you remember from earlier, also expressed in the limbus to a really high degree, and we have HubX as well. Uh, so we're really confident that these cells are actually limbus cells, uh, and those are the cells that get infected. But then <clears throat> we, we did see this um, splitting of the limbus cluster into two different, uh, different clusters. And that gave us the opportunity to look uh, at the immune response of these cells, both the directly infected ones, but also the ones that I will hear called bystander cells. So the bystander cells here are the ones from cluster limbus one. Uh, so they are the ones that are not expressing uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2 genes uh, at the time we looked uh, in the single cell seek, but they are from the culture where we have exposed them to the virus. And the control here uh, in blue in this uh, dot plot is from the healthy C control scene that has not been exposed to the virus. Uh, and here you see that uh, as, our uh, as our first uh, marker, uh, we did put the spike gene in here as well. And we really see like um, this uh, infected cell population is really infected. It's like almost 100% of these cells uh, are really expressing this spike gene to a really high degree, whereas uh, really few cells in uh, in the in in limbus one, the bystander cells are expressing it, uh, and no cells really in the uh, in the healthy seam is expressing it. Uh, that gave us the opportunity to look, as I said, into the immunology immunological response. Uh, and first we decided to look at nf kappa beta activated genes. So here we see um, that almost all nf kappa beta associated genes are actually upregulated in the directly infected cells. Uh, so that's interesting uh, in the terms of um, how cells respond to the virus. So NF-kappa-beta is a really complicated, uh, I, as I hope uh, you all know, like immunology is, uh, is a really intricate um, interplay of a lot of expression, expressions of different cytokines. But what we, what we do, do know is that NF-kappa-beta can become uh, pro-inflammatory. So we suspect that the virus can actually hijack uh, the NF-kappa-beta uh, pathway to express itself even more uh, and to become more infectious. Uh, so the interferon is the alternative pathway. That's the one that will, um, that will shut down uh, more quickly uh, these uh, infections. Uh, and what we rely on <clears throat> when we uh, when we want to have immune infiltration. Um, so what we see here is that uh, the bystander cells, interestingly, upregulate interferon-associated genes more than the directly infected cells. And that's another interesting find because it seems like the the virus can somehow subdue the interference signaling and therefore avoid uh, immune recognition at least for some time. Uh, and that might be one of the reasons that this is such an infect infectious virus and that uh, people can uh, have a hard time uh, recovering in the early stages of it and uh, only um, and will end up having a severe case. Uh, so this is really uh, frightening and interesting. Um, here's a different way we've plotted out these uh, uh, two different pathways as violin plots, where you can see it a little bit more 
uh, graphically. So here we have clustered the uh, the NF kappa beta associated and the interferon associated genes and looked uh, in the different cultures. And we do see an upregulation uh, compared to the control. But I also feel, but I also think you can really appreciate in these graphs that the NF kappa beta is high and is upregulated in the directly infected cells uh, and the the story is reversed when you look at the interferon one signaling pathway. So in conclusion, uh, cells on the ocular surface can get directly infected with SARS-CoV-2. Limbus cells are the most uh, susceptible cell type of the ocular surface uh, and seam organoids can be used as a model to study viral infections. Uh, we also found that infection with SARS-CoV-2 increases the nf kappa beta pathway expression while impairing the, uh, uh, the interferon-1 pathway expression. Uh, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in eye organized is productive, meaning that uh, in, an infection in the eye could manifest um, further down your respiratory tract and become a real uh, uh, case of COVID-19 and therefore uh, the eye can be a route of transmission. Future perspectives that we would like to look into but have not had much time to do yet um, is the need of proteases for, um, uh, for this infection. So uh, this has become even more interesting now with the new Omicron variant. Uh, so what we see here is uh, an infection experiment we did in lymphocytes cells where we uh, pre-treated the cells with a um, protease inhibitor that will inhibit all protease activity, not only temperature, uh, called TPCK. Uh, and if we had treated the cells with that, uh, they um, really didn't take the infection. Uh, this is of course uh, really interesting. And then you could ask, why don't we just go around and uh, treat people with these protease inhibitors? Uh, but we, we do need proteases in our body uh, functioning and therefore that's uh, unfortunately too toxic. So we would have to see if we could find a more specific inhibitor uh, to treat this uh, or to, to use as a prophylactic uh, of infection. Um, so what we would like to see uh, next is, um, is there a specific protease that is most responsible? Uh, so we know that Tempris 2 has been associated um, with, uh, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infection, but we also remember from our uh, monoculture uh, exposure to the virus that the RPE cells had ACE2 but lacked Tempris 2 uh, but, and got infected uh, regardless to the similar level as the limbus. Uh, and here uh, in our single cell seek data, we also saw that only around 6.5% uh, of the cells had both these uh, entry factors, uh, while more cells did get infected. So we are interested in seeing if we could pinpoint our way to another protease. So uh, there are other tempers. Uh, family members that are highly expressed in these cells, the Tempres 4 and Tempres 11E, are more specific to the limbus. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we also see furin um, expressed in these cells. So that might be uh, an, in, uh, an interesting um, uh, in, uh, protease to look at uh, in terms of a prophylactic. Uh, and especially for the new Omicron variant, uh, in one of the reasons it's 
um, and it's believed at least that it's more transmissible is due to uh, mutations in the furin binding uh, side of the spike protein, uh, making it possibly more uh, successful to, uh, to cleavage and therefore to uh, infection into the cell. Uh, however, that's really, really preliminary data as uh, you can all imagine the the, that variant has only been uh, recognized for, I think, two weeks. So more to come, hopefully. Uh, I would like to end my talk by thanking all my collaborators, uh, the Blinkensop Lab, and especially uh, my supervisor, Timothy Blinkensop, uh, and uh, the PhD student who introduced the C model into the lab, by Marco, Marco was. Um, as well as our collaborators uh, at NYU, the microbiology department uh, from the Tenova lab, uh, and uh, from that group, uh, specifically Rasmus Müller stands out because he was the, the microbiologist who had to do these infections and had to handle the live virus in the, in the heights of the pandemic. So I'm really grateful for, for it, to him for doing all of that. Um, we are, of course, also very grateful to the donors uh, and their families for their donations uh, of tissue. Uh, without people like them, research wouldn't move forward. Uh, and then, of course, I need to thank uh, our funding agencies, the National Eye Institute, the um, Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and the Carlsberg and the Lundbeck, Farm, uh, Lundbeck Foundation. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your nice presentation. Yeah, perfect, perfect.